Hi guys, welcome to Friday, May 15th. Uh, don't forget today your reading log four is due. And we are just gonna go over first chapter Fridays. Uh, we'll first go over the PowerPoint, and then I will be reading an excerpt from the first chapter, not the full chapter, just a little, short little excerpt. Some of you might be familiar with this because it's recently become a movie with a recently popular actor. So uh, it's called Call Me By Your Name by An Andre Asiman maybe, or Akimon. So it's the story of a sudden and powerful romance that blossoms between an adolescent boy and a summer guest at his parents' cliffside mansion on the Italian Riviera. Each is unprepared for the consequences of their attraction when during the rest of summer weeks, unrelenting currents of obsession, fascination, and desire intensify their passion and test the charged ground between them. Recklessly, the two verge toward the one thing both fear they may never truly find again, total it intimacy. It is an instant classic and one of the great love stories of our time. So as you can see from the cover, it's a love story between an adolescent boy and a young man. So it is an LGBTQ book. And also by this author is Out of Egypt. And if you like this book, you might also like The Price of Salt by Patricia Highsmith, The Talented Mr. Ripley by Patricia Highsmith. I've read this book, it's great. And South of the Border, West of the Sun by Haruki Murakami. I'm sorry if I murdered that name. Um, but yeah, it's also uh, recently become a movie, as you'll see in this chapter excerpt. We have the movie poster. So this is the movie poster, and the uh, it's a film which stars Timothy Chalamet. Um, he's been in a lot of new movies recently, uh, such as the recently made Little Women that also had Emma Watson in it. Um, and then Army Hammer. Um, if you're not familiar with him, he's also a pretty popular actor. And then so here is the excerpt of the first chapter that I'll be reading. Later. The word, the voice, the attitude. I never heard anyone use later to say goodbye before. It sounded harsh, curt, and dismissive spoken with the veiled indifference of people who may not care to see or hear from you again. It is the first thing I remember about him, and I can hear it still today. Later, I shut my eyes, say the word, and I'm back in Italy so many years ago, walking down the tree-lined driveway, watching him step out of the cab, billowy blue shirt, wide open collar, sunglasses, straw hat, skin everywhere. Suddenly he's shaking my hand, handing me his backpack, removing his suitcase from the trunk of the cab, asking if my father is home. It might have started right there and then. The shirt, the rolled up sleeves, the rounded balls of his heels slipping in and out of his frayed aspergillus, eager to test the hot gravel path that led to our house, every stride already asking, which way to the beach? This summer's house guest, another boar. Then, almost without thinking, and with his back already turned to the car, he waves the back of his free hand and utters a careless later to another passenger in the car, who has probably split the fare from the station. No name added, no jest to smooth out the ruffled leave talking, or leave taking, nothing. His one word send off, brisk, bold, and blunted. Take your pick, he couldn't be bothered which. You watch, I thought. This is how he'll say goodbye to us when the time comes, with a gruff slap dash later. Meanwhile, we'd have to put up with him for six long weeks. I was thoroughly intimidated, the unapproachable sort. I could grow to like him, though, from rounded chin to rounded heel. And then within days, I would learn to hate him. This, the very person whose photo on the application form months earlier had leapt out with the promises of instant affinities. Taking in summer guests was my parents' way of helping young academics revise a manuscript for a publication. For six weeks each summer, I'd have to vacate my bedroom 
and moved one room down the corridor into a much smaller room that had once belonged to my grandfather. During the winter months, when we were away in the city, it became a part-time tool shed, storage room, and attic where rumor had it my grandfather, my namesake, still ground his teeth in his internal sleep. Summer residents didn't have to pay anything, were given the full run of the house, and could basically do anything they pleased, provided they spent an hour or so a day helping my father with his correspondence and assorted paperwork. They became part of the family, and after about 15 years of doing this, we had gotten used to a shower of postcards and gift packages, not only around Christmas time, but all year long from people who were now totally devoted to our family and would go out of their way when they were in Europe to drop by B for a day or two with their family and take a nostalgic tour of their old digs. At mealtimes, there were frequently two or three other guests, sometimes neighbors or relatives, sometimes colleagues, lawyers, doctors, the rich and famous who dropped by to see my father on their way to their own summer houses. Sometimes we'd even open our dining room to the occasional tourist couple who'd heard of the old villa and simply wanted to come by and take a peek and were totally enchanted when asked to eat with us and tell us all about themselves, while Mafalda, informed at the last minute, dished out her usual fare. My father, who was reserved and shy in private, loved nothing better than to have some precocious rising expert in a field keep the conversation going in a few languages, while the hot summer sun, after a few glasses of Rosatello, ushered in the unavoidable afternoon torpor. We named the task dinner drudgery, and after a while, so did most of our six-week guests. Maybe it started soon after his arrival during one of those grinding lunches when he sat next to me and it finally dawned on me that despite a light tan acquired during his brief stay in Sicily earlier that summer, the color on the palms of his hands was the same as the pale soft skin of his soles, of his throat, of the bottom of his forearms, which hadn't really been exposed to much sun almost a light pink, as glistening and smooth as the underside of a lizard's belly. Private, chaste, unfledged, like a blush on an athlete's face or an instance of dawn on a stormy night. It told me things about him I never knew to ask. It may have started during those endless hours after lunch when everybody lounged about in bathing suits inside and outside the house. Bodies sprawled everywhere, killing time before someone finally suggested we head down to the rocks for a swim. Relatives, cousins, neighbors, friends, friends of friends, colleagues, or just about anyone who cared to knock at our gate and ask if they could use our tennis court, everyone was welcome to lounge and swim and eat, and if they stayed long enough, use the guest house. Or perhaps it started on the beach, or at the tennis court, or during our first walk together on his very first day when I was asked to show him the house and its surrounding area and one thing leading to another, managed to take him past the very old forged iron metal gate as far back as the endless empty lot in the hinterland toward the abandoned train tracks that used to connect the B to N. Is there an abandoned station house somewhere, he asked, looking through the trees under the scalding sun, probably trying to ask the right question of the owner's son. No, there was never a station house. The train simply stopped when you asked. He was curious about the train. The rails seemed so narrow. It was a two-wagon train bearing the royal insignia. I explained. Gypsies lived in it now. They'd, be, they'd been living there ever since my mother used to summer here as a girl. The gypsies had hauled the two derailed cars farther inland. Did he want to see them? Later. Maybe. Polite indifference, as if he'd spotted my misplaced seal to play up to him and was some merrily pushing me away but it stung me. Instead, he said he wanted to open an account in one of the banks in B, then pay a visit to his Italian translator, whom his, tra who his Italian publisher had engaged for his book. I decided to take him there by bike. The conversation was no better on wheels than on foot. Along the way, we stopped for something to drink. The bar de Bacheria was totally dark and empty. The owner was mopping the floor with a powerful ammonia solution. We stepped outside as soon as we could. A lonely blackbird sitting in a Mediterranean pine sang a few notes that were immediately drowned out by the rattle of the cicadas. I took a long swill from a large bottle of mineral water, passed it to him, and then drank from it again. 
I spilled some on my hand and rubbed my face with it, running my wet fingers through my hair. The water was insufficiently cold, not fizzy enough, leaving behind an unslacked likeness of thirst. What did one do around here? Nothing. Wait for summer to end. What did one do in the winter then? I smiled at the answer I was about to give. He got the gist and said, don't tell me. Wait for summer to come, right? I liked having my mind read. He'd pick up on dinner drudgery sooner than those before him. Actually, in the winter, the place gets very gray and dark. We come for Christmas. Otherwise, it's a ghost town. And what else do you do here at Christmas besides roast chestnuts and drink eggnog? He was teasing. I offered the same smiles as before. He understood, said nothing. We laughed. He asked what I did. I played tennis, swam, went out at night, jogged, transcribed music, read. He said he jogged too, early in the morning. Where did one jog around here? Along the promenade, mostly. I could show him if he wanted. It hit me in the face just when I was starting to like him again. Later, maybe. I had put reading last on my list, thinking that, with the willful, brazen attitude he displayed so far, reading would figure last on his. A few hours later, when I remembered that he said he just finished writing a book on her Clytus, and that reading was probably not an insignificant part of his life, I realized that I needed to perform some clever backpedaling and let him know that my real interest lay right alongside his. What unsettled me, though, was not the fancy footwork needed to redeem myself, it was the unwelcome misgivings with which it finally dawned on me, both then and during our casual conversation by the train tracks, that I had all along, without seeming to, without even admitting to it, already been trying and failing to win him over. When I did offer, because all visitors loved the idea, to take him to San Giacomo and walk up to the very top of the belfry we nicknamed to die for, I should have known better than just to stand there without a comeback. I thought I'd bring him around simply by taking him up there and letting him take in the view of the town, the sea, eternity. But no. Later. Okay. So that is the excerpt of that. I've also seen the uh, bits and parts of the movie that I saw on YouTube. It looked very interesting. Um kind of like a bittersweet love story so if you like those kind of stories and especially if you like a bittersweet uh lgbtq story this is a good story for you guys it's very interesting and it's uh has a lot of um kind of a growth journey for the young boy who or the young teen who um falls in love with this young man all right so have a good rest of your day and have a good weekend and i will see you guys on monday have a good have a good one